Yeah, somebody, somebody suggested, because we're going to be using the flip chart, if you want to sit more on this side, you might be able to see a little bit better. You don't have to, but th th that might help. We're going to start shortly, but, and we will have a hand mic if you uh, would like to make a comment, ask a question, which will happen as we go through the agenda. We'll have time within each item on the agenda to ask questions when the speaker uh, is finished their part of the presentation. Okay? I'm just, I have no role in this other than to try to get started. <laughs> Just, just one more quick thing. We are live streaming. We are, the live streaming is in progress, so just be aware of, of that. And, uh, you know, so people can hear us and see us, and we'll get started shortly, but we are live streaming the meeting today. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. It's with heartfelt thanks from all the people uh, that have put together this program this morning to you who have gathered here and to those who are watching us on live stream. We want to thank you and let you know that as friends and fellow congregants, we appreciate your attendance. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a church as a body or organization of people with similar religious beliefs. And further for us at St. Michael's, our main goal is to worship our God and to follow the ways of our Savior, Jesus Christ. With that, the church of St. Michael has put together a mission statement, and that is following Christ's example, welcoming all, strengthening each other, and serving the community. You, the congregation, have elected these volunteers, these officers and committee chairs and council members as well as committee members, and appointed them to give their time their spiritual gifts to ensure that the church grows in its worship, its service to the community, and provide an opportunity to find a community here in Christ. I'm proud of these volunteers. You know, your council, your committee, your, your committee chairs, and all the committee people work tirelessly without compensation 
They give her their time, they give her their efforts, and a lot of sweat, tears, <laughs> have gone into uh, where we are today. So, I'd just like to review with you briefly before we get into the main part and then why many of you are here, the question and answer period to the council and to the committees, where we've come from. If you think back three years ago, we moved from fully functioning St. Michael with a settled pastor, music director, office manager, and suddenly COVID. And by the end of that year, no pastor, no office manager, no music director. Everybody <coughs> got together and we got a bridge pastor. We got an office manager. In fact, we got two. And uh, we got a music director, and I saw him somewhere in here. I guess he's, he took off. But COVID really was a turning point for St. Michael. In the interim, we developed a, a system for live streaming. So people, those of you who are hearing me from home can appreciate this. We didn't have this up until that time, so now you can view from home and uh, also make contributions from home. Then Stephen Ministry. We are ministering to each other internally for people who are suffering from everything from depression to loss of a loved one to just the day-to-day -day rigors that begin to wear on you and just, you need help, and we offer that here. So bring you fast forward then to February 4th. Uh, leaders in the church, the committee members, committee chairs, council, put together a program where we were all talking about one thing, and that was getting on a common ground, a level playing field, if you will, <laughs> So we knew what all our committees were doing, weren't doing, and try to make those committees and that council a better place to function and keeping in mind you, the congregation, while we were doing it. So, what's the way ahead? Well, we're here to share the result of that leadership conference, if you will. One very important comment, I was asked this by a friend of mine, he wanted to be absolutely sure this was gonna happen and I'm gonna assure him right now from this lector that we have a question and answer period and there's no out of bounds. And so that is uh, gonna happen as well today. So please, uh, we're going to go through the results of the uh, conference first and then we'll get everybody's questions, whatever they are, and try to give you the best answer you're looking for or that we have. Fair enough? Okay, I would now like to, uh, did someone have a question? Pastor. Pastor. Yeah, I would like to welcome Pastor David. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor David will lead us in a prayer prior to the meeting, and then we will meet with Jay Liska and Rick Welzel. Church, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this church family. We thank you for the faith that you have imparted to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Pour out your spirit upon us this day. Give us your grace, your guidance, your wisdom. We pray that we, we may always be mindful of Christ as the center of our lives, who guides all that we do and say and think. Bless this gathering. We pray that we may do all things in accordance with your holy will. And we lift this prayer to you in his name, Jesus Christ, your son, 
Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I know probably everyone here. For those live streaming who may not know me, I'm Rick Wetzel. I'm the vice president of our church council. I thank you for attending this morning. Um, I was tasked with the uh, objective, if you can read by today's meeting agenda, of uh, discussing the objectives of today's meeting. I don't wish to be long-winded as our presenters have put a great deal of effort into their presentations and deserve our full, full attention and engagement today. It would be simple to say that the objective of today's meeting is merely to listen to our presenters and provide feedback on the ideas discussed during their individual portions of the leadership retreat. However, that statement would only partially describe the objectives of today's meeting. Hopefully everyone had a chance to read the leadership retreat notes prior to today's meeting. Those notes were taken by Jay Liska, who deserves our thanks for their creation and distribution. We do plan to discuss and look for feedback concerning our three primary topics today. Reaffirming our mission and strategy, read by Jay Liska and, and Rob Furr. Untapping St. Michael's potential, led by Charlene Stone and Lanny Lewis and revitalizing small group ministries led by Kevin Kirby and Steve Lacombe. Certainly, an objective of today's meeting is to energize our congregation and help clarify the next steps our congregation will take because of the feedback on our agenda topics. A further objective of this meeting is for everyone in attendance today, and indeed for every member of our St. Michael congregation to prayerfully reflect on how they can take action to support whatever changes we conclude are needed. And make no mistake, while we have an outstanding foundation to build on, further change will be necessary in order for St. Michael to grow in faith, involvement, and membership. We will continue to be guided by the Holy Spirit as we move forward. And now I'd like to ask Jay Liska and Rob Furr to take the floor and begin the discussion around reaffirming our mission and strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for all of the church family that are either here today or live streaming. It's wonderful to see you. Just to reaffirm the objectives for today, we want to share ideas that we generated during our leadership team meeting. We want to get your feedback regarding which of these ideas you think we should run with. And then finally, we want to try to generate some enthusiasm for those ideas to get you to participate in those areas that have meaning for you. So it's about sharing, it's about listening, and as Rick said, that ultimately it's about acting. Uh, we're not making decisions today, and we're not voting on things today. We're having a conversation to decide how to move forward. I could argue that there's been too little opportunity like this over the 20 years I've been at St. Michael to really have a conversation about where we're headed as an organization, both strategically, so for the long term, and then tactically, what ministries do we really want to support? Because we can't be everything to everybody and do everything all the time. We have limited bandwidth. So I look forward to more opportunities like this. But let's consider this turning the page, OK? A first of hopefully many conversations like this so that we move forward not as executive committee, not as council, not as committees, but as the family of St. Michael. <coughs> Deal? Great. As Lanny mentioned in the introduction, our mission, the mission guided all of our conversations in early February, which again is to follow in Christ's example, welcome all, strengthen each other, and serve our community. A wise person once told me, don't do well what you shouldn't do at all. So the first thing we did is decide 
are these things we should be doing? And this was a mission statement that was developed years ago that I think has stood the test of time. Now just a side note, there is a proposal, again an idea, that rather than following Christ's example, we might want to consider the, the words sharing Christ's love by welcoming all, strengthening each other, and serving our community. So give that some thought. It's a tweak, but potentially a meaningful tweak of our mission statement. Any initial reactions to that? Bob. Question. Well, there will be no decisions made. So post this meeting on what you say, following Christ's example versus an alternative. How does that get decided? I would hope the way this would get decided is through conversations, you know, with, with, with the congregation. However, for all the ideas we'll present today, Bob, and particularly the ones we think we want to move forward with, we need to farm those off to the committees that are most, you know, sort of relevant for that topic. Who makes the decision, ultimately, whether that changes the way we think? I would say that the committees will recommend whether it stays as is or we make that tweak and then pitch that out to the congregation to see if there's anybody that has any big objections to that. Ultimately, you know, we have to have, of course, a governance process. We can't, you know, vote on every single thing. But, you know, this is fairly important. So, again, that's why I'm introducing this idea now. So if you feel strongly one way or the other, then let somebody on the council know, and we'll let you know after this meeting where some of these ideas are going to land with regard to which committees they're going to be in. So if you don't want to go to the council, you know, go to the evangelism committee, if in fact that's where this decision might be made. Okay? Oh, well, and Bob, I'm not sure either. As I said, that's why this is going to, you know, move forward as a conversation. You know, we don't have a checklist for every possible decision of who or what committee makes that. But maybe what we need to do more in the future is conversation like this, just to get the sense of the congregation of, hey, that's a really stupid idea, or, you know, that's a good idea, or I'm neutral on that. I could live with it one way or the other. So. Well, uh, Jay, I, I've got a follow-up question. Is, is the question, could I restate your question? Maybe, maybe ask it to check my understanding. Is your question, who holds the decision rights to determine what this phrase should be? Is that a committee? Is that the congregation taken as a whole, or is that council, or is it the executive committee? Is that the question you're asking? Us? Well, I don't know the answer, but uh, I, now I've got the. Well, again, this has this this mission statement has been here for at least ten or fifteen years, so somebody, you know, may know who originally crafted it, but you know, I think it's it's conversation that we want to have within council. I think, again, the relevant committee, and then a recommendation. But again, unlike a recommendation that you read about in the newsletter, the decision's been made, a recommendation at the recommendation stage. So again, if you feel strongly about it, let somebody know. And, and I think that goes for anything you're going to hear today. Yeah. So the missions, that was the mission statement. And from there, so how do, we, how do we turn that into reality? Bob, you'll appreciate this. How do we make these wonderful things happen, right? Welcoming, strengthening, serving. Sounds great. Who, who can really argue with those things? But how do we operationalize that? How do we make it happen? So this is a little schematic, okay, with regard to sort of how we think about developing a strategy. What's a strategy? Strategy is just a plan to get us from here to there. So, we start with where are we now? Where are we with, at St. Michael? Where do we want to be in the future? And how are we going to get there? What's the strategy? Okay, so, you know, admittedly, sort of didactic. Let's put some, uh, I guess, meat on the bones to uh, pick up on Ezekiel. That, that was a joke, folks. <laughs> Thank you. 
So again, br briefly we move on. So the leadership team when we met talked about where do we think we are as an organization right now, okay? I bet you can't tell that we rehearsed this. Where are we right now as an organization? Every person sitting in this room and on the live stream has their view of where St. Michael is. A better place, a worse place, a different place. The same old, a changed place. Carolyn? Um, Hold on. Too fast. Um, there are rumors that we're going to one service we hear other rumors, and I'm glad for this meeting so we can talk about our opinions and things. Nobody uh, covered the early service people if they wanted to come at a, to a later, combine with a later service. And it just seems so fast, and uh, older people like things to slow down and be enunciated, big word for, my husband is telling me to stop right now. <laughs> but uh, this is not the St. Michael that I left two years ago before the pandemic. And uh, I feel like a nobody and here I am, speaking on a microphone, and you want to ask me anything, Jay? Well, thank you, Carolyn. I think, in fact, I know that the sentiments you've shared are shared by a lot of people. Um, you know, I'm very traditional by nature, too, and I'll be honest, I don't like change either. However, as Lanny said in the introduction, you know, change is inevitable. You know, COVID changed the world and it changed this congregation. You know, our staff, as a result of COVID retiring, changed our staff and that changes our organization. Um, so I wish things could always go back to the way they were, but I have no control over that. So, you know, we have to adapt, you know, going forward change, but I think what you're saying and other people are thinking is that you want to be party to that change, right? You want to have a voice in that change. Uh, you, you want to, I'm sorry. Again, as an organization, as a church, you know, like every, every organization out there, as the world changes, you know, we have to change with it. I mean, how many of you worked for DuPont, <laughs> worked for Hercules, worked for, or did those organizations change over time? The ones that didn't change enough or in a timely enough fashion, they went away. You know, I still cry for the DuPont that, you know, I joined 40 years ago. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's not about do we have to change? because the world changes us. But again, I think what, you, what I'm hearing from you and what I believe is we need to include people in the conversation of what do we want to change? What do we want to change and how quickly do we want to change those things? So I largely agree with you, but I would say as a church, we are rebounding from COVID, rebounding from staff changes. As a society, we're rebounding from changes that I don't have to you know, tell you about. Um, and rebounding doesn't mean we're where we want to be. I don't think anybody here is satisfied with where St. Michael is today. What we aspire to is, where our goal is to increase. Increase our faith as individuals, increase the involvement of people in the congregation, and increase ultimately our numbers, our new members, which is going to be the lifeblood at least operational lifeblood for our future. So if we do continue to do things the same way we always did them, 
the trends that we see are decline in every aspect of society of the trends that are going to continue. So we can hold on to the way it was until there is no more, or we can try to get out in front of some of those changes and adapt so that we can achieve our goals. And our strategy to try to do that, Carolyn, and others, is what I mentioned a couple of times already, to increase our engagement so that we don't make unilateral decisions, executive committee or council or committees, but for big decisions, and you know, we'll have to decide on a case by case what's a big decision, but you know, that we share that early on with people so they feel that their voices are heard, that they're party to that change doesn't mean you're always going to agree with changes that are decided, but at least you shouldn't be surprised by those things. So this is sort of where we see ourselves going. Right now, we're rebounding from pretty dark days during COVID. We aspire to be a church that is growing. Again, in faith, in involvement of the congregation, and in new members. And the plan, the strategy to do that is to have more conversations like this. You know, we can't nor should we try to do it alone as any individual group. We need to do it together. So, you know, Carolyn, I hope I love St. Michael as much as I know you and Lou do. Um, and as Lanny said before, you know, you and I, we only want the best for St. Michael that we can go from where we were to where we want to be. But like Bob said before, how do we do that exactly? You know, I don't know. But together, hopefully, we figure that out. So I, we want to try to, again, keep this as a conversation. So Bob, Carolyn, thank you for starting it. You know, this should be 10% us talking you know, at you and 90% you giving us feedback. We know what we think we know or what we're proposing. What, we need, what this is all about is hearing from you. So please continue those thoughts in your hands and take the mic. Okay? All right, with that, Annie and Charlene are going to talk about one of the areas where we have a number of proposals that we'd like your feedback on. And again, thanks, thanks, Bob. Thanks, Carolyn. Before we get started, I, I Carolyn, I I think I understand where you're coming from. And we don't have a change problem. I think what we have is a confidence problem. And that is that many of you don't have confidence in the people that are leading the change or you don't have buy-in in those changes. And I'm here to tell you that I have until July 1st to serve as president and I am going to do everything with the council and the committees to change that for you. And this is the beginning of that. So if you have confidence in the way forward and you believe in the people that are actually helping to precipitate the change, I hope you'll be a part of that process and just let us help you feel better about where we are now. I'm sorry. I was, I was dialoguing, but I was talking to everybody. If, if you um, have a suggestion, if you have a confidence issue, who made that? Why, why that decision? I heard Bob say it. How was that decision made? Then, you know, we want to continue to hear from you on that. And we realized that we made some changes quickly that maybe... Well, not maybe. We should have consulted with you first, but uh, that is going to change. 
and that's going to start today. So, Charlene, if you don't mind. Hi, I think I know everybody too. Um, Charlene Stone, Secretary of uh, Church Council. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. It's really funny how we talk about change and everything. I want you to know, raised in the Lutheran Church, came here maybe 2002, and I've come a long way in that almost everything that happened in this church while I was a member here before I joined council, I knew nothing about how it happened. Nothing. And so I hear people still say they feel that they don't know how things happen. So this is, to me, real change and real movement, just that we have this meeting. So when we talk about we're losing things and we need to go back, I don't want to go back to that. I don't want to be the person who's sitting in the congregation who doesn't know why things have happened the way they happen and just guess. I think certainly barring any privacy issues and things like that, I think it's time that if you want to know, you have an avenue and a, a vehicle for finding things out. So I thank everybody for coming here and I thank council for that. Being on council the last few years was one heck of a way to get your feet wet. Um, you, you know, when all the people who left, we went from in-person meetings to Zoom meetings, not even knowing how to do it. Uh, being on the Christian Education Committee as the chairperson, never wanted that. Was on the committee when Pastor Jonathan was here, and then I came back to it, but only because no one else was interested in taking that position. And then Pastor Adrian, who was the leader of that, she left. And I'm really grateful to all the people on that committee. We have weathered through and kept Kids Sunday School We've gone from tremendous numbers down to maybe 12 or 18, but if it wouldn't have been for these people, there would be no Sunday school at all left. So I want to celebrate that and say that we, we, we need to move forward. Um, untapping our potential, what does that mean? Well, you probably never met a congregation filled with as many diverse, talented, educated people as you've met right here. Everybody sitting next to you, we discussed at this leadership retreat, we bet you don't even know the, some of the people around you, what their gifts and talents are. We are really blessed. God has blessed us. And so we decided to look at what programs and ministries do we currently have in place or did we have pre-COVID and that we might want to revisit or reinstitute or change. Well, what about the people? I just said that. So many gifted people, not only in positive ways of life, Many of you have shared your burdens with others, and you are a great resource to other people and a great comfort. And then what about our facilities? When I moved to China in 2007, we had VBS on, at night because we started the digging process for this ever-growing church. Now we have this humongous church, which was in lockdown, and which every day I drive by to pick up my kids, and many days it is empty. There's nothing going on. We are heating a building. We are paying whatever we pay on the building, but we're not using the building. And so you might say, well, why should we? Because everything we're talking about here isn't about only deepening our faith, but it's about sharing God's word, the love of Jesus with the community. And pastors, your sermon couldn't have been more on the mark today than for what we're talking about. So we took a look at all this and we said, um, what are the programs and ministries that we currently have or had that you guys all loved that we want to uh, at least notice? So we couldn't list all these on here, um, but you know what programs you liked or, or were formerly a part of or are a part of. I know we heard several statements at that meeting that the 60-plusers were really sad to see that just dissolve, that there's no one stepping up to... There was an ad for months, perhaps years, that art was stepping down and that they needed somebody to resume that. So this is not meant to be an all-inclusive list, but this is just pointing out that there are lots of ways. We thought, the group thought, not me, the group thought that we were best at untapping our potential. We're, we're good at creating programs. We're good at um, doing ministries if, if you looked at these three categories. Are we best at programs and ministries, at untapping our people potential, or using our facilities. So we felt that we were second best at untapping the potential of people here, getting people involved in many different ways. And it could be, it could be that you serve on a follow me team. It could be you're on the choir. It could be you're on the council. It could be, you know, you're on hospitality. It could be many, you're in Stephen's ministry. You're, um, 
you know, a caring shepherd, whatever you are. Um, and so there were some of them, committees, council, choir, care, follow me teams, and I don't know if any of you have anything on your minds you're thinking that we also do. But we, we did have people say, we don't have enough time, not fellowship where you're just eating together, but time to actually get to know people. Because that's what Christianity is about. It's about the fellowship. It's about the community. I mean, the Bible says, you know, we're not in this alone. We're meant to be a community. And then our last one, which people thought we were in need of the most improvement on this one, in using our facilities and buildings and grounds to be part of the larger community, increased congregational activities, and not just faith-based, both faith-based activities and not, you know, just like, you know, years ago when I grew up, we used to have Girl Scouts in the church. I mean, just little things like, like that. And while you may think, well, that's not talking the gospel, no, but when you invite people into this place and they see what a great facility is and they interact with people from here and how kind and welcoming you are, they might want to come here too. And our ultimate goal is spreading the word of the Lord with all those people. One thing, and you might have ideas today or even thoughts on whether we should use these facilities for that, um, whether it should just be for us, whatever your thoughts are, you're free to share them. But I, I digress because I want to go back to the whole Sunday school thing. When we were considering, um, when Pastor Stewart was here, we were considering what are we going to do with Sunday school in the future because our numbers are really down. And... Um, we don't have enough teachers. And I contacted someone from Church of the, oh, I don't know, which is the Lutheran Church? There's two Lutheran churches in Westchester, Calvary and another one, Advent. And their Sunday school coordinator told me pre-COVID they had 22 teachers. Post-COVID they have two. So um, while I am not here, and Lanny, we're not here to talk about tap, untapping all this potential because we just want to invite new people. We want to reinvigorate what we've got because there's a lot of families that each of us could name who have not shown up or come back ever since COVID. And that's a loss for all of us because we're a family. And so here today, uh, what we're talking about from, from the meeting that we had on the 4th is just how can we get back to, or maybe we're not meant to go back, but how can we move ahead and untap the potential of people? There are people here, speaking of 8 o'clock services and 1030 services, I also... Um, schedule the acolytes. And you know my kids, because big. this week they were not an acolyte. But you know that one of the biggest challenges that we faced is we're draining a lot of people who are you know, here every month. They're the same follow me team captains, the same ushers, the same acolytes. And it's really draining. So while that is certainly no reason to simply just go to one service, those of you who are here, we need your ideas. How can we invigorate things? How can we get more people to want to be part of this? How can we untap this potential? Because each person sitting here today is capable of doing one thing. Maybe you're not interested in that, but how can we make more people interested and want to be part of that? Because honestly, there are times when my kids are accolading and I think you're all sick of seeing them. So um, I, we're welcoming, you know, whatever ideas that you have for that. And how can we really utilize this beautiful space God has given us? And all of these great people, so many talented people here. And Lanny is going to talk about, what are you going to talk about, Lanny? Oh, this paper. have questions for me or even just comments on like what you think of those thoughts that those weren't necessarily my thoughts but from the meeting would you agree with some of those things that people your uh, other people said at that meeting would you disagree would you take it further what are your thoughts
anything else? Yeah. Uh, Janet asked, what has been done? Yeah, thank you. I forgot, I better get off of here because I'm on TV. Um, Janet asked, what has been done to try to get more people to come here, to, get, to reach out? Is that what you mean, Janet, in terms of the church? Plays a role, uh, and that's the columbarium committee. Not something that we think about or want to think about often, but it is a large investment that we have, around $200,000 that we have invested out, outside here. And it is available to the community. It's not just our members, and so we often don't think about that. And our prices at our columbarium are significantly less than any place around. And so if it's something that we're all gonna need at some point in time, it's at least worth thinking about and looking at and letting the community know we can do a better job of that. Marilyn Forney from Livestream wanted to talk a little bit more about your chart of activities and she wanted to talk a little bit more about Luther House. I'm not really sure what that means to talk a little bit more about Luther House. Obviously, I'm not the person to speak directly about Luther House, but yeah. we have a lot of experts Art, here. Do you care to comment on Luther House? I don't. I, Marilyn Fournay wanted to address Luther House a little more, but I don't know. Perhaps she. Yeah, without any specificity. But as far as Janet's question about what have we done, I mean, a large part of that would be Pastor David to address that since his time here. Did an amazing job in creating this the, the, the um, once a month events where folks can come and just be together. We did Valentine's Bingo, we did um, Minute to Win It, and I, I think back in November we did a movie night, um, roasted marshmallows, and those are events that everyone's welcome to. And we actually have a family here now who has been coming the past few weeks. They're friends of um, uh, Charlene and Matt Dickens. And they're coming here. Their children are now enrolled in first communion class. So it's stuff like that that's happening. And bit by bit, as we open up and invite, and it's really for all of us when these things happen, to invite our friends to come and to be part of this. That's what brings people to a church like this. So there are things like that that are happening that welcome the community in um, that, that have shown that they, that they work. So we have a family here that's, we have lots of new families, but that's one example of, of what we've, been, what we've done that's new that's brought families in. So, so um, CACs back on February 24th had a fundraiser event called Empty Bowls, which had, I don't even know what the number was, but a huge number of people that came in here um, and helped CACs raise money for the amazing work that they do. And we, just by allowing them to be here, um, allowed them to raise more money. But just the, the exposure of us, of St. Michael, as a place of welcoming, a place that um, welcomes the, the work of the community. And one of the, the key, I think, factors in, I guess, the, not the viability of a church, but the importance of a church is that if that church disappeared tomorrow, would it impact the community? And I could say, truthfully, because of things like empty bowls, because of what we do with CACs and, and um, Family Promise, if St. Michael were gone tomorrow, yes, this community would be deeply, deeply impacted. Uh, but it allows people to see St. Michael, not just as that building you pass when you go down the, the street, but a place of, of welcoming and, and a place that um, supports the mission of, of Christ. So there are lots of things happening that just, as long as we can be exposed as a church, that's an opportunity for evangelism. So there are things that are happening, yeah. I don't know how many of you, uh, I'll get right to you, Rick, just one quick statement. Uh, had the opportunity to come down State Street from uh, back at uh, Wayward Beverage and you're going down the hill and at the base of the hill at... Uh, Blitzendorf's. It's the, it's the uh, towing company across from the YMCA. There's a sign on this garage in big, bold letters, five-inch letters, thank you, St. Michael, for hosting the Empty Bowl. 
and thousands of people go down that road. You know that, that's a busy highway uh, for Kennett Square. So that's just one thing. The other thing is we are trying to partner uh, with different churches, with different organizations. Uh, we are talking uh, not only about our social ministry, which Rick Honecky could uh, expound more on, but we are talking about, you know, can they put in a good word for St. Michael? Can we get anything in our giving back from that? What can we do? And it's not just bringing the people in, it's driving the church out. So those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about, and that's what I wanted to get to and talk to you a little bit. I'm going to read the list quickly, but we're, we'll address the particulars in the uh, question and answer right after I finish blowing my uh, own horn here. Reinstate a time, talent, and interest survey again to make sure we're staying on track. Open our facility more to outdoor groups like clubs, service organizations, other churches. We started that. Increase our internet presence. Um, I, for one, got on the internet and I saw a man desperately looking for a church that welcomed all. And I just typed in there, come to St. Michael. Our door is always open and you can ask for me personally. I'll make sure you find a home there. So that, that's an important piece of this. Hosting events on the lawn, who said that? Drive-in movies, uh, cookouts, game days. Bring a friend to church. You know, if each one reached one, and we're 100 and what, 50, 130, that would be 260. Just think of it, each one reaches one, we double. Uh, pair new members with established ones. Um, I know Cami is back. Cami Franz, in, in terms of uh, that program, it is limited, but, uh, you know, pairing with a senior person, uh, a new member might get a better idea, better feel, and, and, and a more welcome sense. Re-energize the cookie patrol. Someone said they missed delivering the cookies, and I had one couple tell me, they really enjoyed receiving them. So that is a very important part of our ministry. Represent diverse cultures. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, become a reconciling in Christ church. That will be addressed. And then revise our worship service schedule. And I know that's going to get addressed. So uh, those are just a few things. And now... Oh, one second. Two things. Rick has a comment. And then um, we had a, a comment online, which was about the programs and ministries. I'm not sure if they couldn't read this, because obviously we have this chart, and this is designed in five in the back. I don't think I could read this, but we just listed here like Faith and Foam, Friday Fun Night, Stephen Ministries, Bible Studies, Men's Bible Study, New Women's Bible Study, uh, CACS, Luther House, VBS, a huge outreach effort, VBS. So if you're uh, watching online and you couldn't see what some of those are, most of us know what the programs are that we've had over the years. Um, we're just talking about the fact that we think we're, we're pretty good at this. We're pretty good at starting things, um, but the people and the facilities piece was missing. And Rick, you had a comment. Yeah, just quickly, did Marilyn have a specific uh, question? Okay, we can address her. If you let her know, we'll address her individually. Rick? Yeah, I think, I think what we're doing is fantastic, and one problem we have is just not being able to get the message out publicly as well as we should. Um, I know the, the website has really been changed a lot, and I, I think um, I'm thankful for that because Riddler has really done a great job reinvigorating that. And I know I've said it before, but we have hundreds of people pass our church every day going to the schools and such, we need a sign out there that tells people what we're doing, what activities are being happening, welcoming people to the church. Right now, nobody knows what's happening as they, as they rode, ride by. And it's a great advertising piece that we can get a sign up there. Yeah, we had that going, Rick, and unfortunately, we lost some momentum 
uh, on it. Uh, we do definitely know we can't have any lights and we can't have any electronics according to the powers to be at East Marlboro. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's not lost and we will be looking into it. Well, yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever it takes. Okay, uh, did we get everybody for, the, for this segment? Would, would it be a good time since you just, the last thing you ended on was changing the service to let those people who might want to, you know, uh, talk I'm, about I'm, that? Because I don't want them to not have an opportunity to speak. And I, I know there are some people here that would like to talk about that. Right, so. Could I ask um, Rick Wetzel, Come forward, uh, Charlene. Are you leaving? Okay. So, Rick, could you come up, please? Uh, we want to uh, we want to make sure we have all the uh, players. And Mark Swanson, uh, if you would come up. So who should I give the mic to? Uh, Rick Wetzel. Well, give it to whoever would like to speak. Or do we want to tell people a little bit about what went into that decision, or do we just okay? okay. And then and then we can talk about uh, and get some feedback, which I think that's why we're here. Okay. Uh, everybody knows Mark Swanson. I hope if you don't, you know that he's our committee chair for uh, music and worship. Mark. Okay. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are interested in this topic. Uh, we actually have a, sort of a background paper here that I think that Rick is going to hand out to you. This, the background on this um, came about the impetus for why would we change the, uh, why would we even think about changing the worship service schedule? Many of you know uh, that the schedule really has been, the status quo has been in place. Uh, I arrived here in 1998, and I know that the schedule was in place well before that. We had an 8 o'clock service, we had an 11 o'clock service, the only, with, with education in between. The only tweak that has occurred that I'm aware of since then was we shortened the schedule up slightly by about a half an hour uh, about 10 years ago. We moved the second service, the later service, to begin at 10.30, which did compress the education hour. The impetus for even discussing any change to the worship service was the identified need for concurrent education uh, opportunities at the same time, occurring at the same time as a worship service. Um, that was identified by faith formation, and um, this is, in our view, our perspective, uh, this was not a new topic. Uh, Pastor Stewart, I think, actually raised this from the pulpit during her time, his time as our um, bridge pastor, and kind of challenged the congregation that to prepare us for the, the eventual call of the settled pastor, now Pastor David, that we should start, as a congregation, we should start reevaluating and thinking about some things and potentially tweaking or changing things. So in, in recent months, the Faith Formation Committee came back to Worship of Music and said that they had addressed some prerequisites that would be needed for concurrent education and, and worship one of which was to be some team teaching, um, I believe. So it was then time for, for worship and music to make a recommendation to council what, how we thought this could be accomplished. And the result, the resulting announcement was what we came up with in worship and music. We identified that, and it was previously included in the communication, that the best time most likely to do this concurrent education alongside of worship would be at 9.30 on a typical Sunday morning. And we took comfort in the fact that the 9.30 service has always been very successful uh, during the summer months, and it's also been successful at times like Reformation Sunday, the Cantata Sunday, and other special times during the year. So we had a successful model, we felt, for a 9.30 service. And then the, the other thing that occurred there was our meeting in which we made this final decision and the recommendation to council occurred within about a week of the retreat, which you 
we've been hearing about. And there was a lot of positive energy at the retreat identified about bringing us together as community. One of the, the hallmarks of the summer service at 930 is not having two separate groups worshiping at two separate times, but the, uh, the positive benefits of having us all gather together under one roof and, and the energy that comes from that. So that was the energy in the room uh, the, the, the day in February when we made this final recommendation to council. Um, now you may, you may be thinking that, yes, did we get ahead of ourselves? Um, did the train leave the station too quickly? There's a lot of excitement within both Faith Formation Committee, which is the artist formerly known as Christian Ed, um, as well as worship music and lots of great discussion at the retreat on February 4th. So that's a little bit of background orally. I'm not going to try to repeat everything that's in the, the paper you were just given, uh, but we would welcome additional feedback and your thoughts. Uh, so that's a brief synopsis of how we, how we got here. All right. Just back up a minute. I'm Bob Madsen. Most of the people know me. Some don't. I'm 88 years old. Is this okay? Okay. Can everybody hear? Yep. Okay. I'm 88. I joined St. Michael's Lutheran Church in the fall of 1980 downtown. Been active all these years up until recently. Been on council. Been on been president, led a call committee that resulted in Adrian coming, been associated with Luther House for 20 years, resigned from that last year. The last 10 years of that, I was president of six corporations, et cetera. Not alone at Luther House, Lou Wonderly, Marilyn Forney, Art Connectal, Darwin Weika, Gene Kirkledy, Stalwarts. We were all blessed at that time. We were retired. We didn't need another job. We could take the time and make things happen. So if you wanted a meeting tomorrow as today and we want to meet tomorrow, we're available. We got the buildings and everything done and successful operation. As to the service change, it is not a new concept. Over a decade ago, it was visited, two things were cited as why we chose not to go ahead, and I don't see that they change. One is that the Sunday school staff will not be able to go to church. They'll be doing Sunday school, correct? And secondly is that um, it's going to close off the ability of new people when they come. There'll only be one choice. Today there's two. And it would seem to me, if you're trying to grow the numbers, that it would be advisable that there are more opportunities than one service. My personal opinion, that's, that's where that is. Um, another one in, there. in any event. So the key thing is, is that we need to be sure what we're going to get from this change, because most of the things cited seem to be for the benefit of the members Day. I don't see necessarily with a one service really being that much for people outside. And so as far as summer saying it's a successful thing, true, except during the summer, attendance is very is low because why? People are on vacation, kids are out of school, et cetera, et cetera. It's a it's a, a not a normal situation kind of a thing. So they're just my comments, other people can chime in. Papa, thank you. Ed Schultz. So I did, I did read this uh, piece of paper, and I'm not, I, I, after having read it, I'm not sure what is actually being proposed. In other words, uh, <clears throat> when would Sunday school be going on? <clears throat> when, would, when would a service be? And so forth. It's just not clear to me for some reason. Well, 
Yeah, go ahead. The, the answer, Ed, the answer to that is, excuse me, I'm, excuse me, excuse me, I'm answering Ed's question. Excuse me. Um, Ed, the answer to that is in September, we're planning to go to one service at 930 with concurrent Sunday school. It'll be whatever we start. Uh, Faith Formation is finalizing the dates for when that will be started. Bob, go ahead. Sorry. What's that? Oh, sorry. That's usually that's pretty, uh, pretty rare when people can't hear me. Um, <laughs> the, we're, we're going to one service in September at 9.30. Must be going bad. A 9.30 service with concurrent Sunday school in September after Labor Day. Everyone hear that? Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Excuse me, my, my old age, things pass by me, and I have to reflect on it. The other thing, I, I missed the point, was that a number, back a decade or so ago, the situation existed that some members wanted their children to come to church with them. And so the question, making this decision, what about the Sunday school teacher? What about the parents and, do, and their desire to have their children in church with them? I, I believe uh, I can supply some of that answer, and Charlene can uh, as well. Yep. Um, there's no doubt that was a question. We passed out a survey to all of the current uh, students and their families attending Sunday school. Um, I have it in my book if you'd be interested in seeing the results. And the, the primary thing that we asked them was, you know, how long have you been coming here? Um, do you attend church with your children? And that sort of thing. Um, and the overwhelming majority, mind you, we don't have that many families. We might have 10 families total coming to Sunday school. The overwhelming majority was they would love to give this a chance. They didn't speak to whether it would be a, offered at an 8 o'clock or a 1030 service, but what they said is um, our lives are so busy that we can, we can barely handle getting our kids to one hour a week. And then on top of that, if I have to come to Sunday school and then church, then I have to bring my older child back to confirmation at night. So it's a changing time. Um, that doesn't mean everybody said that that's what they wanted, but it was way more than 75% at that time. So we did survey them and we surveyed the adult class as well because they're impacted. Adult Sunday School also meets during that hour time and what, what would they do? And um, again, the majority said that they were interested. And at some point, Pastor can address this point, which is what we're finding happening locally, nationally, from the ELCA, and what the trends are towards um, bringing young kids into Sunday school. And it's if you look around in the church on a Sunday, we're blessed to have any kids that we have coming up to the children's chat, but it's it's a challenge to get young families to church at all. So I hope that helps you. Another part of the question, Charlene, could you just stay there for a second? If parents wanted to come to worship and bring their children in, that hasn't been shut off, has it? No, you, you can still choose as you want as the parent. Um, and we've also been discussing things since we have communion every week. Um, in some congregations, kids leave after the children's chat. They go for a shorter lesson. They can come back to commune with their families if they want as well. All right, we have another question. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an 8 o'clocker, so I don't see a lot of you. And uh, my name's Mary Bainey. I officially joined here, I think, in 98 with my husband and my daughter. Um, I applaud the fact that you talked with the Sunday school families, but they were surveyed. Not everyone was surveyed. And in interviewing the Sunday school families, a large chunk of people who were affected by the decision with the eight o'clock service were not surveyed. And that goes towards your statement about the lack of confidence and the feeling of the train leaving the station. There's an unfortunate 
um, coming together here of a decision that was made that seems to be have done in conjunction with the retreat, which sounds like perhaps it wasn't done in conjunction with the retreat, but didn't involve all the congregation. And yeah. that's where the disconnect, the lack of confidence, and the unhappiness, I think, comes from. Thank you, Mary. You should know, do not misconstrue this. The concurrent Sunday school is not the reason for going to one worship service. We discussed meeting after meeting, faith formation, and if anybody's here from faith formation, you will know that we discussed ad nauseum different options and alternatives. All that, was, all that the Christian Ed Committee did was, or Faith Formation did, was survey parents, would they like, would it be better for them if Sunday school was offered during a church service? We didn't say there would be only one. We didn't say there would be 10 services. So that survey is a separate entity to when church is being offered. Some people proposed an 8 o'clock service and keep the 1030 service and have concurrent worship during that. All sun, the only changes faith formation made is we will no longer exist as a separate hour between services. However you want to work it out, whether it's one service or two services, that's up to you. But So that survey was only done amongst our committee. That's why I didn't have the authority to distribute a survey to anybody else. Um, I just want to add on to what Charlene's saying about this concurrent Sunday school. So for St. Michael, this is a new concept. Some of us have been talking about it. Some of us really never heard of it. It's actually very common in a lot of other churches, but yeah, I think we could have done a better job communicating what that is and why. So, um, and Pastor could probably explain this better, but the way I understand it, the children will come to service with their parents. After the children's chat, they would leave go to Sunday school, they would come back and commune either with their families or with their teacher. So they are going to be in worship for the beginning and possibly the end. Um, but this is what other, this is what young families want. This has been something that's happening. We just have not had it here. And we think that there, this is something that we need to offer. I guess I really want to know, uh, it, this is an old phrase from business, but what's broke and how did it get broken and uh, what are we doing about it now? Uh, I, I don't see the, I didn't see this brokenness in our religion. And the other thing I would say too is if we had two religious services, why don't we have one that is ultra modern I know the teenagers would love it. And one is a traditional one. Someone capture that. Yes, Tom. My name is Ray Foy, and I'm a former pastor. And I wasn't going to attend the meeting today um, because I really feel like um, this is a fait accompli. Leadership has decided that it's going to move forward with the vision that it has. The world changes. COVID brought change, which no one liked. There was a loss of community. And I know that the Holy Spirit um, was with this church from the very beginning. It would never have been planted in this place except that the Spirit somehow made that possible. That being said, after the service this morning, a few people approached me and said, oh, won't you come and say something? And they were bemoaning the loss and it's clear to them that it is loss of the 8 o'clock service. They weren't consulted. 
this plan has been announced, and it's a death for them. What I want to say about that is that I know the numbers are small at 8 o'clock. I come to the 8 o'clock primarily. The people I see there have been foundational to this church since before I was the pastor, beginning in 1980 and up to 1990. They have given hundreds of thousands of dollars in support to this church. They were key leaders, and I, when I say hundreds of thousands, they might be millions, literally, that have been given over the years, Bob Matson being one of them, just as an example, who's been here since that early time. Their stewardship, their presence, what they have sacrificed for this place to be here has been dismissed in their opinion. So they look at the proposal as accommodation to young families who've given nothing, sacrificed nothing, but we're going to change the world. And, and that may be necessary for the church to have new life. But there is a whole set of people this proposal does not suit. And there is not an alternative being offered in terms of variety, choice of service, whatever you want to say. If, if the old statistics on congregational growth are still true when a congregation appears to be 80 to 85 percent full in in worship attendance new people coming in will say there's not room for me there certainly is room at the eight o'clock service i mean nobody's <laughs> foolish enough to say we just can't take any more people and and maybe we're sustaining an eight o'clock service for the sake of sustaining it as you said, Mark, it's been this way since forever that you know. It was that way long before I came here as the pastor, when I came here. Um, but, but I'm not sure we can't do both and, and still um, move forward with what is being proposed in, in essence by the new vision. My name is Art Kaneko. I'm 86 years old. I hail from the center of Lutheranism in North America, the Midwest. <laughs> My hometown in Michigan, with an area population of 30,000, has 10 Lutheran churches, a Lutheran school, and a Lutheran senior center similar to Luther House. I am a lifelong Lutheran, baptized, confirmed, and married in the Lutheran church. My wife and I have been members of this church for 45 years. Both of us have been very active in, school, in church functions. In addition to serving on council and finance chairman, I was building finance chairman for the building of this sanctuary. Spent 28 years overseeing the construction and operation of Luther House and was instrumental in the formation of 60 plusers as in, and was involved with it for more than seven years. Mary Ann has been involved in caring shepherds and captain of the Follow Me team for many years. In addition, she has delivered Meals on Wheels for over 40 years. In the 45 years I've been a member of this church, I've never seen so many unhappy members. As I see it, the elephant in the room is change. In the past several months, we've seen changes in the service, the liturgy, the music, the delivery of the sermons, etc. Many people are unhappy with these changes. Were all these changes necessary? Who made the decisions for these changes? 
Did anyone think of the consequences? Perhaps the crowning blow for 35 of us has been the elimination of the 8 o'clock service. Perhaps many 1030 people have the same feeling about the elimination of their service. There are many reasons for people choosing the 8 o'clock service. No one asked us for our opinion. It was just eliminated. The elimination of choice is a sign of a dying institution. To grow an institution, one, one must expand choices, not cutting them. I trust we want the church to grow. In the Midwest, many churches have Saturday evening services to accommodate people, in addition to two or three or two or more services on Sunday. Was this considered? In the untapped potential, elimination of the eight o'clock service reduces the opportunities for people to get involved by 50%, greeters, ushers, etc. In the area of revitalizing small groups, we've just eliminated a group of 35 people. What is the plan for adult Sunday school? Time is of the essence in addressing these issues. People will vote with their feet and or their pocketbook. This week alone, seven people have indicated they are leaving the church. In the future, I suggest the council be more open with the congregation before changes are contemplated. Thank you. So, so I think we've heard enough compelling reasons to consider reinstating the 8 o'clock service. And I'd ask that council reconsiders that. I think um, you know we've heard from from a lot of people today that there is a reason for them to, to be here at the eight o'clock service, and um, it's certainly something that wouldn't be difficult to go back to. And I would suggest the council considers that. Thanks. Anybody else? Want to ask? Yeah, just a. For us, what Rick said, uh, um, Ahmed Schultz uh, happened to be on the Building and Property Committee. But uh, uh, so looking at the proposed program, uh, I don't see where having an 8 o'clock service would in any way uh, change what the young people would, uh, would like to have. That's all. You're heard. We hear you. No change has been made as of yet. There is a council meeting on Monday. Oh, I'm sorry. April 10th. April 10th. Is there any objection to having an 8 o'clock service and a second service concurrent with youth Sunday school? In other words, if, if the 8 o'clock continued to be the 8 o'clock, then we would have a Sunday school program for the kids while the parents were in service. Would that be a satisfactory solution to this dilemma? At least give it a shot, right? No, I'm, I'm asking. Okay, I, I, it's a question, so if anybody has a response, I want to hear it. I like that idea, Lanny, but I also am concerned. Um, unfortunately, as a member of the choir, we've been coming earlier for rehearsals and things, and I'm really missing out on my adult studies classes. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be a part of the women's a Bible study on Mondays. But I do would really miss, and I don't know how we could compromise with that, the, uh, the fellowship that I have gotten in the past couple of years with, with being with other adults. Right. For the, uh, what if we didn't change the time for either service? What if it just stayed the same and we had a concurrent uh, service for the kids? Uh, would that still accommodate you? 
Well, I'm, I'm still okay with having a 930 service, but I'm still also, um, I've been a member since 1974. And I, you know, have gone to both services. And of course now with my membership in the choir and my love of music, and I just need that part in my life. Okay. That I come to the come to the later service, but eight o'clock service. I, I hear what you're saying, Lanny. I, I'm just and and I like the idea of the nine thirty service concurrent for the children. I'm just you know concerned about those of us as adults getting our nurturing as well. Do we have adult Sunday school after the nine thirty service? Yeah, changing nothing in the schedule. I'm just trying to formulate what it is that you all are trying to say to us on the council and worship and music. If we maintain an eight o'clock schedule and we maintain a 9.30 schedule or a 10.30 schedule, does anybody have objection to concurrent services for the kids as long as the teacher's needs for worship are met with the eight o'clock and as long as we have staff to do it. Is there any objection to that? So I just, I just, I agree with you, by the way. I thought eight o'clock service is an important service as a young person. I think we have to have it. I also think that it's important for young families to have concurrency in uh, an earlier service because being, it's hard to say I'm 50 and I'm a younger family, but, um, you know, a younger family who is constantly being pulled in 17,000 different directions with their kids for, you know, we have the sports and I want them to have this impact. I want them to be around you all folks. They understand the importance of church, the importance of family, the importance of faith, which they hadn't had in the first part of their lives. It's, it's important and it's definitely needed. But unfortunately, I also love my sports and so do my kids. And so we've got that. I'm also a single dad of three, so we got that. And that's, I think there's a lot of other families, because I see a lot of people in this community whose kids have multiple things that are going on, but they all want faith, and they don't know how to bring it. They don't have the time, which is sad. It's also one of the reasons why Katie and I, you know, by the council started this, like, family fun night, which I know got some things, well, we don't have things for older adults, and you're all family in my opinion. But we did this because without children, without young people coming to church, there will be no more church. And I think that's, that's something that we're missing. And so if we don't have some change that enables these younger families to come here with their children that's at an appropriate time for them so they're not here all day be and not being pulled because I hate to tell everyone this, this, the other sports will always take priority to church unfortunately and that's a sad state that we're in and, and where we are right now as a community and where we are as a world and I've been moved by all the things you guys have said and I'm one of the people that said I thought eight o'clock service should, I thought eight o'clock should stay personally but this was a change we had to make. And so I think we ought to do an 8 o'clock service, and I think we ought to do a 9.30 service that's concurrent. That's my opinion, but I think we need to do something. It can't be later because you you'll never get the kids here. So that's just my point, and I think we'll take it back to council, and we should discuss it and think about it then. Yep, and I, I just want to say one more, two things, actually. First, we'll work out. I, I'm one of the leaders of adult Sunday school, and we'll work it out. We should work out the service and the faith life and if the adults meet, whether it's earlier or later, I'll work that out. I, 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 I will. I'll ask the people who come to the class when they'd like to meet, and we'll tr try to have adult Sunday school. But I don't think that should be the driving decision. What should be the decision is to honor the people who want to meet at 8 o'clock and to figure out how to try this other service to help younger families. You know, and let's try 9.30 and see if that'll work. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll evolve again. The second thing I want to say, it, it is getting late. Yeah, and, well, we and, and, and no, I know that, but I just think we should try to wrap this up. And if we need a second meeting to continue our discussion, but we've been here an hour and a half and I, I just wanted to well, throw that out. Well, I was prepared up. to be here until dinner, so. It, it's not uh, about that, it's we're about. We're getting out early. Yeah. <laughs> okay. One more, Art, uh, after this, I just, we just came here about two years ago, but what I, we, the church we came from was doing, I'm sorry. <laughs>
the church that we came from was doing exactly what you're talking about. They had service, I believe, and the children would come with the parents. The, the chat was right before the sermon. We would have the children's chat, and then they would gather the children, and they would go to Sunday school or whatever, and then they would come back after the sermon and be able to go to communion everything and still be with the family that's what they did so uh, yes Rick Honecky would you mind bringing the microphone to Mr. Connectel again was a uh, Saturday night service ever contemplated in the Midwest that ends up being almost as big as the Sunday services because of sports, et cetera, et cetera, that people are committed to on Sundays? I don't know, but it will be. And, and we know in the past we tried that when Pastor Jonathan was here, and things are different now for sure. I just wanted to add one point, which is I don't care for me personally when you have the service. If it's at 8, I'll be here. If it's at 1030, I'll be here. If it's at 1, I'll be here. I'm flexible. But um, I need, we need all of your help because we are not dripping we need people to volunteer. My, the Sunday school teachers are tired, whether they miss church service or not. They have been plugging through two years of this. We, we have very small number of volunteers, and I think, I don't want to speak out of turn, I think that's across the board. I mean, we need more people to step up and to volunteer. And so at 8 o'clock, um, sometimes it's easy for me to get people to do acolytes at 8 o'clock. Sometimes I can't find anybody. So we really need to band together and to try to encourage people to participate and be part of the service. And that goes for Sunday school, too. So I appreciate your help. All right. So we're going to finish up very quickly. But I'm, I think it's safe to say to all of you that this is going to be a reconsideration of this program and that we hear you. So... Unless the vote goes horribly wrong, 8 o'clock should stay in, but we are going to have to deal with whether it then becomes 9.30 for the second or 10.30 or 10 or whatever compromise we can make to accommodate most of you. But unfortunately, and I, I, I have tried now for three years, we can't please everybody. So uh, please bear with us. We hear what you're saying. We appreciate the emails. Keep them coming. And now, Steve Lacombe. So heard, heard you loud and clear. And, it, and as I look about, about the group and say how important small groups are to St. Michael, and I, 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 I look at this, and it is the participation of all of them. Most of the people I know here is via small groups. So we have 21 that are active, and it, that, that, it's a wonderful statement. But in our meeting in early February, the things that came out that were critical, and I really want to point to this one as well, but feast groups, wine and cheese, uh, adult lunch, it was more how do we continue to connect the adults in, in, our, in our congregation as well. And I, I wanted to point specifically to the 60 plus and the work that Art did, and again, I spent an hour and a half on the phone with him talking about how he put that together and the work that he did. And so when we talked in February, we said this was a critical thing that we needed to come and, and get together. Art chaired that it was a, about a year before COVID that he was trying to exit and do this. He did an incredible job. What he built was, as I talked to the people who participated, is awesome. So I just want you to know we're going to work towards this. But this 60, 60 plus adult lunch, we need to have it sometime uh, that is not in the evening so people can drive and, and, and do that. But we need to, someone to step up that would participate. Again, I don't want to make promises that this is going to happen. We're going to need to crawl, walk, run to do this. We're going to, instead of having it, we had April through September, we're going to have to have one event. And we start to do this and then build the momentum again. So I just wanted to speak to this. Feast groups, wine and cheese are relatively simple because if we get people to sign up, then it kind of runs itself once you set the parameters for that. And then uh, Kevin and team have done, been doing a great job as it really, uh, relates to uh, 
some of the youth and adult programs that are coming together, working again with uh, what is needed in the community. And the last thing is the 30-hour famine. The, 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 the kids had asked if that could come back. But I really wanted to speak importantly to this because, again, it's the same thing we talked about, the longtime members, et cetera. How do we connect them in? And, you know, we talked about what that genesis was. It wasn't Art's idea. It was the pastor's idea. It, it came to him and said, hey, our congregation is getting older. How do we connect people and create those relationships? And as we do that, find out what the needs are, and then they're more likely to be involved in other programs. So that's the, the wonderful part. So thank you. And again, I, as I look at this, I know you guys are all apostles for small groups. And uh, just know that we know it's important. I just have a point. The lunch one piece our activity was programs, okay? And they don't just pop out of the sky. That take, that's where the lion's share of the work that Arthur did. He spent time going to visit programs or activities where they had programs and would decide whether or not that would sort of fit with the group that he knew was coming to the lunch, okay? So again, my point of sharing that was just how difficult that is to, to replicate it, but how, how do we do that for one and make that happen and then do it, do it again as well? So ab absolutely understand that, how important. And he went through all of the list of the things that he did, that he put together the dinners. They were not just here, they were outings, et cetera. So anyway, thank and, you for and, that And I just, just, I just want to just make one thing. Early on we talked about taking advantage of our people, right? So if we have 10 arts in the room, we'd be a great place, right? I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, and so we need, so, what's that? I don't know. So anyway, so my, but my point is, is we, need to, we need folks to kind of, we have the same kind of similar people doing a lot of the same things, and it's taxing. And I think that's the whole point, and trying to create ways to get not that we can't utilize the people here, because we have some great people in this church. And the reason why I'm stayed here is because we have great people in this church, and there's still, I'd like to meet and know and get to know better, and why my kids love a lot of people in this church. But we also need some folks to do more things, too. We need things to, to, to happen, and, and uh, we need things to take place so we can have fun again. And just as a little kick for the wine and cheese, the May 10th Friday uh, family night is a painting wine and cheese night, just so you guys know. Um, we'll talk more about that later. But my point is that this is, Lanny, no, no I'm kidding. I just, I just want to say thank you all. I just wanted to say we need people, and that's the point. All right, the way forward. Sure. Uh, where is that microphone? Um, I think today was a really great conversation, and that's always the place to improve the church is through dialogue. But I do think we all recognize that we do need to make some changes at the church, right? The congregation has not been growing through COVID. The number of giving units are down. And so we need to do things better and change things. But the change has to be for the better. And we heard an example today on the 8 o'clock service. A lot of people feel really strongly about that. And as the church council reconsiders the 8 o'clock service, I hope those people that are considering leaving reconsider as well too. It's absolutely heartbreaking for me when I heard that some members were gonna leave. And we wanna honor the people that were the foundations of the church and have been here. And it was mostly kind of more senior people who were thinking about leaving. That was just heartbreaking when I heard that. So I hope people who are considering leaving will reconsider and stay. They're valued, I know their voice. You know, there's nothing worse than when you don't feel like you've been heard and you've been here a long time, so I think that's really important. But to have our kids come to the church and not see the people who were the foundation of the church would be a really major loss to do that. So just for anyone who might be considering leaving, please reconsider. We need you here. We want you here. The foundation of the thread of the history of the church, so I just make a plea to have people reconsider. And maybe one last thing. Also, to give people the benefit of the doubt, I'm not involved in the meetings uh, on the council and all of that, but I know the people that are, and everyone is trying to do it in a spirit to make the church better. And so if there's something that's not being done well, 
forums like this where people can say, hey, let's think about that is a perfect way. But know that people are trying to do things in the right spirit to try to have a servant leadership heart and just give people the benefit of the doubt. And if something comes up that you don't feel good about, bring it to someone. And let's have a conversation. But we're all a family. We don't want anyone leaving. Thank you, Randy. Amen. Amen. Um, the way forward. The way forward is to deal with what we talked about today. The issue of the first service going away will uh, be put to rest. Uh, the issue of concurrent services put to rest. The issue of building confidence back for you all. We will begin anew and try to reestablish your confidence in us. And all I can say to you is I was impressed with what Art did uh, in his, uh, his talk. I was baptized in a Lutheran church 70 years ago. I was a, a cradle Lutheran, St. Matthew's in York, Pennsylvania. I don't know how many of you know that church, but it is, it is huge. I was in many Christmas plays I sang in the choir. I married my wife in that church. My three children were all baptized Lutherans. And when we came here and found out there was a Lutheran church a mile and a half away from our home, we got very excited and we joined. I had spent 25 years in nonprofit raising money for abused women and children nationwide. It's called the National Exchange Club. You can look it up and um, had some experience and a spiritual gift I felt God wanted me to give to St. Michael. And so uh, Rick Durasmo approached me and here I am. But the point is I'm here for the good times and the bad times and clearly we're not in a real good time but we are in a transition time. I'm staying, many of the council are committed to staying, so if we screw up, it's only because we're trying too hard. And we want to hear from you when we need to back off or not go too fast or whatever it is you got for us, let us hear. Some of you are not afraid to write emails. Others of you I haven't heard from, but I'm glad you were here today. And with that, I bid you a good Sunday afternoon. Once again, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of your spirit here this day. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our faith. Thank you for everyone who is here today. We ask you to bless us as we go forward in our day. Continue to inspire us with the gospel. Help us to keep that message of Jesus Christ at the center of all we do, all we think, all we say. Help us to be Christ for the world today and every day. We lift this prayer to you in his name, Jesus Christ, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That together, as your people, we say, Amen. Amen.